Hello and welcome to another episode of Fintech Focus TV, powered by Harrington Star, global leaders in financial technology recruitment. Head over to harringtonstar.com where you'll be able to see some of the greatest jobs in financial technology recruitment across the world. You'll also be able to find a host of insight to help you grow your brand, your team, your network and your career. You can see the latest financial technology salary survey. You'll be able to download the issue of the financial technologist focusing on the appetite for disruption. And our latest top 1% workplace awards will be out at the end of this year. If you work for a company that's a great place to work in financial technology, we want to hear from you. Enjoy the show, and I'll see you soon. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Fintech Focus TV with me, Toby Babb. Today we welcome back for, I think it's the third time onto the show, this time in a different guise, wearing a different blazer, it is James Maxfield from Juco. James, how are you? Hey, I'm great. Thanks, Toby. Good to be on. Good to have you back. Um, like I said, this is the third time on the show. I think so, um, yeah. We had, you know, because we did uh, something with Baton beforehand as well, didn't we? Where Simmons we, where strategy we, yeah. as well. We did Absolutely, one as well. Yeah, 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 that's right. So there's been uh, lots of different pieces where we've had uh, had conversations. It's always good fun. I love talking to you. I think there's always loads of things you can take out and learn on it. Um, for last... Was it a year now, six months? Yeah, almost coming up to, uh, yeah, kind of eight, nine months now, kind of officially. It does, yeah. Kind of lose, lose track of it all. But uh, you've been at one of the companies that I've loved for a long time and I've been a big fan of, which is Juco. Um, and recently, I know you started in a slightly different position. You've been announced as the Chief Product Officer, so congratulations first and foremost on that. Um, but it's a great company, a great fit for you. When, when I saw you go over there, it sort of made a lot of sense to me you know, straight away. Um, we were talking beforehand, I've always liked what Christian puts out there, I think he's a great commentator on the industry, um, you were sort of you know, espousing some of the good stuff that they're doing. So I think it's a really interesting thing to talk about and I think the company's right in the middle of an area which is really important at the moment mm -hmm. as well. So we're going to get into all of that, we're going to find out a little bit about how you guys are helping your customers, um, okay. I think there's loads of interesting things actually from, that I want to talk about which I'm going to surprise you with because we didn't talk about this beforehand. But that sort of uh, strategy background, what you're doing at Sending Strategy into you know, the product role, I think is quite an interesting journey. Yep. And it's one which I'm seeing more and more people taking at the moment. And I think it's a really great background for you to come into in that, yeah, moving further forward as well. So I want to touch on that. But before we do all of that sort of cool stuff, let's talk a little bit about you, your background, and then a little bit about what Juco do and who you're helping. And sure, you okay. So the floor's yours. Okay, great. So, yeah, so I guess kind of had a bit of... I've been in capital markets really kind of all of my uh, all of my career kind of in, in banks obviously kind of had a, a journey at Senate Strategy obviously where uh, I spent some time there for five years really kind of trying to help customers unlock a lot of the problems I saw as a, as a process owner in, uh, in in kind of banks and obviously kind of moved over to Duco uh, as probably officially kind of started this year really to, to, to take on the kind of a, a product and solutions role which is kind of now kind of morphed into kind of the chief product officer role which I'm obviously kind of very, very proud of kind of getting that title. Um, and again, I, I think, you know, the interesting thing for me is, is, is having been on the other side, and I've, I've, I've found this in my prior role as well, having been inside a bank and understanding actually how complex investment banks are, even small ones, a lot of their challenges around automation, the legacy technology that we hear a lot about, that the real challenge of unlocking even small scale automation because of some of the organisational and system complexity. Um, it's, it's really enjoyable to be able to come into a vendor who actually kind of plays directly into that space. So it's kind of always going to be a good fit, I think, in terms of uh, a data automation company, which kind of Duco is. Yeah, yeah. And some of the challenges that I've kind of grown up with, kind of witnessed and tried to solve, uh, so, solve during my working career. Absolutely. So, uh, so that, that, that's, why I'm, uh, that's why I'm excited about being there. Perfect. And it's been a good sort of uh, you know, journey and, and, and movement for you, as you say, onboarding into a company there that sort of fits where, where you're going. You, you touched on it there a little bit about what Juco does, um, but give us the, the sort of elevator pitch about how, what and, how, and where it helps. Sure. Well, well Duco is a low-code platform. Uh, we're kind of pure SaaS, you know, single instance, public cloud, that's all we do. Um, and, and whilst our, we're probably quite known for reconciliations, because a lot of the capabilities in Duco as a platform mm. are really well suited to helping customers unlock a lot of the reconciliations that the challenges that they have. You know, our, our broader strategy really, or the product vision, is ultimately to move kind of much more into the data automation space. So reconciliation will always be a core part of what we do. Just recognised from that from Waters as well. You know? That's right. Yeah, and that was a really that was a really nice award for us. Obviously, all awards are nice, but what what made the Waters one especially kind of uh, valued? Was really it's kind of customers and clients that vote for that, you yeah. know, and certainly kind of partners that we work with. So to get that recognition from the industry 
that were kind of seen as really the cutting edge kind of provider of reconciliation products in, uh, in the marketplace was kind of really nice for us. Um, but again, coming back to that broader kind of data automation story, there's a lot within Duco as a platform that can unlock a lot of the complexity that I've kind of seen kind of yeah. first hand in, uh, first hand in my time there. And, and the nice thing around us is we are kind of truly low code. And what that means is for our customers, that they don't need to, they don't need a large in-house technology support team to yeah. look after them. They don't need to fight for prioritization around small changes or getting stuff done. They don't need to be a budget line item in the kind of the CTO's budget around support, uh, kind of ongoing kind of CTB type activity. Mm. You know, we, we fully kind of go into the users. And whilst that doesn't mean, whilst that means that you can still have all of the right governance and auditability that you need in a kind of really heavily regulated environment, it kind of really unlocks a lot of cost and we talk about business agility as well. You know, the ability to get things done quickly. Yeah. You know, quite complex problems can be solved in Duco. You know, within a matter of minutes yeah. by changing some configuration and rules. Goes through the process to make sure it's good, and then obviously that gets kind of deployed to the users, which is, again, quite transformational. With some customers we talk to around, even for quite small changes, because of the technical nature of the platform, you've got to go through a very rigorous software development lifecycle, yeah. which you know can take months just to kind of really kind of solve even kind of small data problems. So that's kind of really powerful for us, and it's one of the really exciting things I see in customers when we kind of take them on that journey, yeah. that you kind of really unlock that value for them. Yeah, it's a fascinating thing, isn't it? And I, and I think coming back, to, you know, just a, a, a step further backwards, that journey that you've been on from Ascendant there where you're talking to you know, five years to companies and helping them look at some of their problems and consulting to them and helping them go on their transformation journeys, et cetera, et cetera. I guess that puts you in such an interesting place to sort of transfer it into a JUCO and then see sort of see these problems and then be able to move it into product. Because I've said this a few times on this show that product is is to me one of the most fascinating and fastest growing areas within financial services, and I think it was probably undervalued and underutilized for a long time. But I think the the rise of the CPO has probably been one of the C level positions, pro you know, alongside CDO, if that's mm -hmm. it, which I think is probably a little bit behind the CPO at the moment. Um, but I think that, that sort of journey has been great. And when I look at founders and when I look at people who've, who've come through, it's the ability to look at customers and, and see where their product can really fit into that. And I think it's great that, that you guys are looking at that and your background for it, because you can have a lot of different journeys into product management mm. and uh, into, C, into, into a CBO, CPO. I think yours is a really unusual, in a very positive sense, journey into it. So talk to, talk to me a little bit about that sort of... Uh, that sort of segue and how it's worked for you. Sure, sure. Well, I, I had the good fortune to, uh, to to be introduced to Duco by one of uh, one of the members of the board, who who I actually knew from a from a prior life, and her journey had been quite similar to mine. Had grown up in the fast paced environment of, of banks, yeah, delivering change, building things with technology, making things happen. Um, and and actually, she said to me, it's a very similar skill set actually to be successful. A lot of what you're doing. Kind of resonates with some of those background experiences and i would say exactly that actually because if i think about you know what what is it for me what does a good cpo look like what does it look like in terms yeah, yeah. of success you know clearly you've got to have that strategy and that vision you yeah. know and that's maybe being able to take a step away from the product and and look at what you know what is it that customers need what are some of the industry problems what are some of the challenges mm. that kind of can, can be out there and, and whilst that may sound obvious when you've been in the product a long time, you can very quickly get distracted by, this would be a cool thing to do. Yeah, yeah. Well, what about this innovation? Yeah. And, you, and you kind of lose you that get blind by all, don't you? Yeah, that's right. So that ability to, to kind of, from my perspective, not be too in the product, yeah. I kind of bring some value in being able to step away. Stakeholder management, again, in a growing company that maybe has gone from uh, being maybe quite, let's just say, informal, which I think most small companies are. Yeah. Decision making is quite easy. As you get bigger and bigger, yeah. and your customers get bigger and bigger, yeah. and they become a bit more regulated and, and you know, some of the rigour they need, obviously that kind of stakeholder management, even internally, becomes quite important. You know, are we well, able to align? That's, that's been very much groups. the Juco story as well, hasn't it? Because that, that has been the story of what looks to, from the outside in to be fairly significant growth over that period as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think as you kind of go and engage with bigger and bigger customers who are quite formal, quite structured, yeah. you know, your, your language and your approach. You know, you want to be innovative and fast-paced, right? Because they, they think that's kind of what they're buying and agile and all yeah. of those cool words that are attractive, perhaps, to an organisation who's been stuck on legacy tech for a long time. But you have to get the balance right. You know, you have to be able to demonstrate that you understand the problem statement, that you can be clear around how you're going to execute on that transformation yeah. for them. And actually taking people internally on that journey as well. Again, coming back to, you know, an organisation that maybe has grown up quickly and been quite fast-paced, you can make decisions very rapidly. Mm. Obviously, as that customer base grows, 
and as expectations of those customers grow, and, and again for us, you know, we don't offer customized versions of software for our yeah. customers. You're all very much kind of within that one code base. You know, so being able to balance different customer requirements, making sure that you're clear around what features you're going to focus on and what features you're not actually. You know, your communication loop back into those customers. You know, being honest and transparent with them. Yeah, that might look a really important change to you, but actually. You know, we, we can't mutualise that across the yeah. rest of our client base and most of the other customers are asking for something else. And that can be quite a difficult conversation. Yeah. But again, that honesty and transparency, coming back to my point about stakeholder management, yeah, becomes, yeah. becomes kind of super important. And, you know, ACV growth, revenue growth, cost management, all of those things become important as well, right? You can't lose sight of those yeah. because they're obviously a key part of the company's goals. You must be loving it. It must be so well aligned to what you're doing, where you want to go, what, you know, what your experience so far has brought to you from two very different sort of prior lives into this, what well, I say very different, but complementary prior lives that have, that have like colluded to this and that role. It's a really good fit, isn't it? Yeah, and you know, like it's, you know, it's a bit of a cliche, but, but kind of people make a company. Yeah, um, yeah. Really great mix of kind of very diverse mix of people, yeah. diverse mix of backgrounds, uh, even quite diverse age groups, actually. Yeah. So you, you've actually got a really kind of nice kind of, I would say, melting pot of kind of different people in there, which gives a real energy and a kind of uh, excitement, I'd say, right? yeah. kind of uh, working there. You know, again, back to my prior life, you know, working with an investment bank is not always exciting, right? Yeah. When, you're a, when you're in a regulated environment, it can kind of get a, it can get a little bit dry. But yeah, yeah, I don't see any of that, Duco. The necessary regulation at various stages. That's it? right. That's yeah. right. Which has got opportunities within it, and I think, look, if we if we're looking at where you guys are sat, and you know that journey you mentioned beforehand about you know this very strong background in the reconciliation space, moving into the, you know that that data that data world. I mean, we said it beforehand, and I, just, I wrote it down over there, saying every every problem is a data problem within the industry, more or less. And and uh, you know, we look at the, you know, I mentioned before the rise of the CDO within the space. I think data, yeah. you know, more and more conversations I have on this show are about people how they're, they're solving problems or creating opportunities with regards to data. When we look at what most companies are looking to do in the space, it's improve efficiency, improve productivity, remove friction, all that sort of stuff. Data is very much the key to that, and the other side of it, is, of course, is how you use data to improve the customer experience, the mm -hmm. customer journey. So, talk to me a little bit about that. Talk to me about what you're seeing in your customer ecosystem. Talk to me about what you you guys are excited about, and where you see the opportunities, and where you see the value that you're creating at the moment within that. Sure, sure. Well, the CDO analogy is a really nice one because actually, I think the industry, certainly across, let's just say, middle and back office, has, has long try to view the problem as almost like a, an application one or a functional yeah. one. Yeah. Okay, I get a new settlement platform and that solves all of my problems. Probably solves part of them within that settlement kind of view of the world, but doesn't really do any of the upstream or downstream kind of consumers or stakeholders, yeah. if you like, of the process, any favours. Might make it a bit better, but a lot of those problems are still still there. If I think about the rise of the CDO and their importance, again, it's, it's a realisation around the criticality of data yeah. and data ownership and data governance and kind of you know, data stewards to use some of that language. Um, the, the, the nature of that, from, sorry, the importance of that from a regulatory perspective, but ultimately from a, a kind of a process efficiency perspective as well. Again, if we think, if I look across the landscape of our customers and prospects and you know, probably every organisation I've been into, <clears throat> that lack of data trust and that lack of data automation is, is why most organisations, even small ones, have you know, five to 10,000 people in back office all over the place. Yeah. reconciling, checking, validating, transforming, enriching, trying to get data in a shape that they can do things with. The CDO has a really important role to play there because if you can get that model right and you're clear around your data owners, you then start to move into a different place where people just start consuming data and using it. Mm. I don't need to reconcile it, I trust it. Someone else has kind of done that role. Now, as a reconciliation company, there will always be reconciliations, yeah. but it's a very different type of conversation and I think that fits really neatly into us where we start talking to customers and say... If you start thinking about data ownership rather than process ownership, you're going to unlock a lot of that kind of last mile of automation yeah, that yeah. you typically kind of hear a lot around. You know, and you know, for some one of our customers, you know, they have a, you know, let's say they have a 95% STP rate or a match rate on a process, but that kind of 5% is like 3 million things that somebody's got to do every day. Yeah. So it's still quite material in terms of its workload. So again, that kind of that intersection of the actually the CDO and, and, and our kind of our product set yeah. is, a, is a really neat one. It feeds in well, doesn't That's it? That's right. And, and whilst not everybody's there on that journey, because again, that you know, if we think about when CDOs kind of started to appear, what was that, maybe 10, 15 years ago? Yeah, yeah. BCBS 239 and yeah. all that driver. 
you know, it can still be a bit of a revolving door for some organisations because culturally they're not necessarily ready for what the CDO brings. Yeah. But some of them we're starting to see are looking and size at size and scale. I mean, it was it was a big ticket, big company role for a while. Wasn't yeah, it? that's right. And you're seeing the sort of size of company, I think, go down to where a CDO actually comes into it, to a phase where, you know, I, I mean, going back 20 odd years ago, 25 years ago, I think the CTO was very much a sort of IT director, wasn't it, or an IT manager in the right. companies, which is where you see you know, data managers at, at, in, in most companies at that sort of stage. Now you will see very few hundred plus companies without a CTO in their in their business, whereas you know you, you'll see very few CDOs in companies that are you know less than that size at the, yeah. at the moment as well. So I think it's a very interesting sort of pathway for it all, and I think it's a it's a, a necessary one because I do think that, that data is you know we're, we're doing a, a talk in America in October, um, talking about. Uh, you know, data being the, uh, the the new oil, as the old expression yep. goes, and how ready is your engine for it? I don't think a lot of companies have got the right engine ready for the oil to be you know to be put into it. And this is where having the right you know plumbing into into that allows it to happen, which is mixing a few analogies from plumbing to mechanics <laughs> and all those sort of things. But I think those that you know, that's where where companies like you have the real opportunity to work with businesses and work with the the right people in those businesses to to massively increase their opportunities within that to utilise data in the right way because I think it's data utilisation that really is the is the missing ingredient at the moment. Yeah, and, I, and for us again, you know, you know, the language we say with customers is your infrastructure is complex. Yeah. Even for small organisations it is. Mm. Your data is complex because it comes from different places, it's in yeah. different shapes and different forms. You can't get a system to do all of that. Yeah. You know, unless you're going to build a Greenfield Bank, which yeah. is, is quite rare. You know, so our role there is saying to customers it's a data problem, but we can solve that for you. Yeah. So actually, we kind of start to fill those gaps around transforming data, or, or maybe getting it in a different shape or a different format to enable you to fly it for your system, yeah. to be able to, to perhaps to trust it. And again, you know, I've used the analogy in the past, but again, we talk about the human API a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, and again, you know, the human being who is actually very good at being flexible and seeing different patterns and reacting, responding, which typically sits around most processes, middle and back office, within yeah. an investment bank the level of automation is quite low because the data is poor and obviously to your earlier comment, you kind of need good data to make yeah. the engine work, right? Yeah, or you exactly. need the kind of the oil to come in. So again, being able to kind of work around that kind of ecosystem for us is a, yeah, is a really kind of natural kind of place for us to go. And as a, as a, C, uh, a CPO going out there and, and looking at, at the customer and saying, right, where are their, their bottlenecks? What's, what's been the feedback to you about where... Um, Fear or opportunity, or, or both of them sit. What are, what are some of the key things that people are in the client base are, are talking about and really worrying about at the moment? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say the, the number one question that comes up with every customer going talk to, can you help us with email? Yeah. Because email and big shared inboxes. Yeah. You know, email is still typically the entry point for yeah. a lot of customers into the process. So, yeah, you know, they might they could have a great reconciliation tool at the back of it. Yeah. But obviously, if you've kind of got people in the middle, kind of moving stuff around. So yeah, that, that's kind of the big, and that's, that, that observation comes from a global tier one bank yeah. right the way down to a kind of small asset manager. So yeah, yeah that, that problem is, is a challenge. We're thinking about it actively in yeah. terms of how we think about our product strategy and how do we start to bring in some of that capability. Um, there's obviously some very interesting innovation that's been out there for a while, probably maybe in other industries outside of capital markets that you know, when you start looking at what some of these product capabilities are, you know, they're kind of quite powerful. And I think it's, it's kind of that, I would say, is kind of almost the number one kind of pain point and then you start to get to other areas, which again are linked to that problem. So, you know, workflow is another one that comes mm. up a lot. But actually, when you talk to customers and say, well, actually, what, what do you mean? Do you mean workflow in a system? Mm. Well, no, actually, that isn't the problem. The problem is actually outside of a system, so outside of an application, because typically, as soon as you go outside of that, you're either back into email, you know, you could be on Symphony, perhaps, if you're yeah, in front yeah. office, or, yeah. you know, Microsoft are moving more kind of, We've seen kind of Microsoft Teams appear a lot more in that kind of communication course, yeah. workflow traffic. Yeah. Um, but again, big problem for customers. There's multiple parts of the workflow, isn't it? As well? Yeah. And, it, and again, it's, it's really that kind of process handoff. Yeah. It's where the people get involved. Because again, it's not uncommon to go and talk to a C-level executive in a bank that will say, have got 10,000 people doing these processes. But actually, I don't, no one can really explain to me what they do. Yeah. And that's not because of failure internally. Yeah. It's because the process variation yeah. around what all these people are doing around email management, yeah. for example, really, really high. Yeah. So it's quite hard to write that stuff down. You know, you can't really activity-based cost 
all of that stuff out, yeah. which again, typically you need to drive investment spend or kind of ROI programs. Yeah. So it's quite a complex kind of problem to solve. Yeah. Um, and, but again, as you say, back to your point, you know, that I would say is kind of the number one yeah. ask of us at Duco. We like the platform. We love what you guys do. Actually, how can we kind of get more into it? So yeah. that's a big driver for us. Interesting, interesting thing for you to be sat on and thinking about and pushing and prodding. Yeah, definitely. And again, you know, most of... Um, I'd probably like to spend more time around our technology and, and spending more time with our engineering teams. Um, but actually, there was been a few months, mate. Yeah. <laughs> but actually, there's loads of really capable people who can do that a lot better than, than I can. Yeah. I actually spend a lot more of my time out talking to customers, you know, having conversations like this, yeah. being out in the industry. And again, I think the super, you know, one of the things I have learned is it's, again, whilst it's a cliche, super important to be connected to your customers. Yeah. Super important to know what the market's doing. Yeah. And, and you have to drive your innovation strategy of problems that your customers need solving, yeah. which is a really, really obvious thing to say, yeah. but actually is a trap I've seen other companies fall into. The innovation's great, but actually the customer says, I'm, I'm, so, really I'm, so, to need I'm that. so pleased you said that, because it, you're, you're absolutely right, look, it is an obvious thing to say, but it's so common for people to be, and I, I think particularly in this industry, particularly in financial technology, you see so many companies who are uh, like telling people they need to fix problems which they don't really have the pain around, and, uh, and I see it as, as probably one of the most common things about people who lose funding or run out of runway or don't sell what they want to do or put finger point about what's happening in the marketplace is they're not solving problems which people have asked them to solve or mm -hmm. have said this is you know, the thing. So when you come back to that number one issue, it's like how are we going to get into that situation and deal with that? And I, and I think that again comes down to having the right people in the right job to go out there and spend time with the customer and do that rather than having very, very clever technology people who are sat there telling people what they need to do and getting frustrated when they say, we don't need to, we haven't got that problem. It's a funny thing, isn't it, the way that Yeah, that and that balance, up. right, yeah, and like any of us, you know, you don't, if you go and buy a car, yeah. you don't want the car salesman telling you what car you should drive. Yeah. That, well, that's, <laughs> that's my well, choice. I always, I, I, I always think of the Henry Ford faster horses sort of line when it yeah. <laughs> comes into this. That's and right. There's elements of that which has always got to be right, right, you know, you, you need to be able to tell people where they can innovate and where they can improve. But at the same time, you've got to look at it and say, what's the actual problem here? Mm. Um, and I think, you know, that, that going back to that Henry, the, the sort of miscommunicated piece of the Henry Ford uh, piece is, is, is that people had a problem about getting from X to, to, uh, to Z in a certain amount of time. And this piece wasn't necessarily about having faster horses to get to their stages. How can we use an automobile to get there in a, in a quicker yeah. in a quicker time? And how can we spill the, the problem always came about the issue? And I think that's a really interesting area to, to, to look at. The other thing I've seen you writing about um, a lot recently, and, and uh, the beauty of LinkedIn keeps us connected all the way through, <laughs> doesn't it? But you guys have been very deep into the you know another one of the big issues that we're seeing at the moment, T plus one and everything around there. What can you tell us that's going on in that space? Yeah, I mean, the T plus one kind of settlement change is currently North American, well, it's Canada, US, and Mexico specific. So if you follow kind of any of the kind of the meme stock challenges around Robin Hood kind of yeah. back in COVID time, you know, that clearly pricked the interest of the US regulators around the, the, the risk that a, a long settlement cycle could take, mm. you know, and, and in that context, you know, the kind of the T plus two kind of time frame it takes to settle uh, securities within those markets. So they, there'd been some messaging for a while that the US, certainly the US regulators were looking at it. What they announced earlier this year was a move, obviously, to shorten that settlement cycle from T plus two to T plus one. Um, and without kind of getting into the specifics of, of what they're looking to do, we think big picture about the industry. The last 10 years has all been around processing getting faster. Mm. You know, securities have already moved from T plus four to T plus three to T plus two. We looked at some of the rules around collateral and margin that kind of came out kind of 2015, 2016, moving that process, making it kind of T plus two or T plus one to end of day. We think about transaction reporting, which has been a big burden for the industry in terms of compliance, you know, for the last probably 10 to kind of 15 years almost now. Um, again, that's all around getting information out quickly. So effectively, kind of big picture, that, that whole kind of middle and back office process is just getting quicker. Mm. So the, you know, being able to run with perhaps batch driven technology where I put something in today, something pops out tomorrow and I give it to someone to do something with, you know, clearly that kind of runs out of road when you're in a much more kind of faster kind of time frame. And I think the other kind of component for, for customers that we're talking to now is, is they're really looking at it as an opportunity to say, actually, the world is getting faster. Mm. Do I take an opportunity actually to look at regulatory driven change, which kind of this is, to kind of take a fresh look at some of my processes. So, yeah, kind of big picture, a settlement window shrink, 
as kind of margin or collateral kind of uh, time frame shrink, mm. as regulators want better data and cleaner data quickly, yeah. what it's really doing is forcing the industry to start looking at that processing engine that sits in the middle and say, you know, how can I optimise it and how can I make it faster? Yeah. And back to our kind of earlier comment, and again, it kind of plays in nicely, nicely to your narrative, you know, it's a data problem. Yeah. All of these are data problems. So it's not necessarily around, can I get a faster engine? Yeah. Because obviously, to your point, yeah, yeah. kind of it's the wrong type of oil going in the engine, not really going to do it a lot of good. Yeah. So, so that for us is kind of where we're talking to customers now. And again, you know, our kind of sweet spot around being able to help customers process better or improve their processing by getting their data better and improving that kind of data quality. Yeah, yeah. Really kind of logical place for us to play. So yeah, we did a webinar a couple of weeks ago. We're talking to a couple of customers now around kind of how we can help them unlock some of their processing inefficiencies, but more importantly, kind of get them compliant, get yeah. them ready for this. It's such an interesting area and such an opportunity again for people to do that right. And I think it's one of those things where you've seen it at various stages when change comes into an industry that there are uh, people who are thinking about it before the curve and then there's people who are, who are very much racing it to catch up on it afterwards. And, uh, and I think what you guys are doing, I noticed the webinar and all that sort of thing is, is it's good it's, you know, it's good thinking that allows people to get ahead of the curve on that. And I think Juco are very good at giving that thought leadership out there and, and uh, allowing people to be better. We're, I know we're on a deadline at the, at the moment, so I want to just talk about uh, a little bit about 24 and, and where you guys are sat. This will be out towards the end of this year, 20, uh, yeah, 2023. If we look to, to um, trends that you can have a look at in 2024, if you think what's going to be hot, what's going to be uh, important, and, of course, what's happening with Juco and what can, we can expect to see from you guys, Give us a bit of excitement, wet the whistle, what's happening? Sure, well, well I think back to the earlier comment, you know, again, if we look at a lot of the things that are on kind of the mandatory or regulatory kind of t horizon for yeah. the industry, kind of more rewrites of transaction reporting, we're going to see more, again, coming back to my earlier comment, things are going to get a lot faster. Yeah. You know, Australia, Singapore, Japan, they're all kind of rewriting their transaction reporting rules. That's going to drive change for customers because they're going to need to comply and that will give them the opportunity to have a fresh look at some of the challenges. So that continues to be a focus area for people. Cost is still a problem for the industry. Mm. You look at cost income ratios, back to my earlier point, you look at the thousands and thousands of people that are occupied in these kind of middle and back office processes. It's very hard to unlock a lot of that cost, but again, you know, kind of organizations, I would say starting to maybe think a little bit differently around their appetite for innovation. Mm. So actually, do I start looking at the marketplace and look at perhaps other solutions? Um, think about data differently to earlier comment. I think mm -hmm. there's, there's definitely a shift there. And, I, I, and certainly when I talk to customers, start to see a slight mix or change perhaps in some of the people that you start to talk to. Okay. You know, maybe the kind of the process owner or maybe the ops or middle office head um, may well not be from a traditional ops background. You know, okay. They may well yeah. be from another part of the bank. Starting to see some, techno some people who would have been in technology move into some of those roles and also vice versa. The process owner is moving into technology bringing maybe a slightly different perspective on it, which again, I think is quite interesting around organisations maybe thinking about solving the problem differently. So yeah, a lot of excitement, uh, a lot of things around there. You know, the cloud journey continues to build momentum. It's, it's probably a lot slower, I would say, internally in banks than maybe we, we see externally. Yeah. Everybody talks about the cloud stories, but there's a lot of wood to chop there. But I think the value, again, for, some, for an organisation like us, you know, we were able to pour all of our investment spend into a single instance of our code. Yeah. We put a load of innovation in there. We've got you know hundred plus customers. We take good ideas from, and um, you can't compete with that with an internal build. It's yeah. impossible. So yeah. again, that kind of yeah. realization of innovation and mutualizing that investment spend, um, we're starting to talk to some customers around. And then from a Duco perspective, what does all that mean? Um, we want to give more. I would say probably out of the box, out of the box, or maybe prepackaged products to customers okay. around things such as T plus one. Yeah. You know, we've got a, an Amir refit product that we have now that we're talking to customers around that will kind of keep them safe. From, from next March when those rules come in. So the ability to give these kind of out of the box, yeah, yeah. pre-packaged kind of industry best practice style solutions, we see a lot of value there for customers. Definitely is, yeah. And, and again, for us, you know, we can turn those on, you know, you can be live within 24 hours. You know, Amazing. so if you think about, if you think about the app store, you know, if you think about the Apple analogy, which yeah. is always a good one, yeah. you know, we'd want to be at the stage where we've got these packages that customers can effectively, you know, which Download is exactly where you want to be off and running in a simplistic basis in the industry. That's right, stuff, isn't it? That's yeah. right. Kind of very low friction in terms of implementation costs. Very kind of low level of kind of technology needs. So we're kind of yeah. thinking a lot around those prepackaged solutions. We're thinking about additional innovation into yeah. the data automation story. So I've talked about email, but again, that's an area we're looking at now. We're looking at helping customers get a, a much wider variety of data into the platform. You know, be that P 
PDFs, be that other document types. That's going to be kind of a big focus for us. And then I think back to the comment on workflow. Again, you know, how do exceptions man get moved around an organisation and around the industry? You know, you can have a, a system with a great workflow, in, yeah. but as soon as your users are outside of that box, kind of it's not particularly kind of yeah. great solution. So again, trying to piece some of that together for customers, either with things that we either develop ourselves, but I think increasingly connecting to the ecosystem, being able to kind of provide integration points into some of these other tools, be able to offer some of these multiple integration points perhaps for one exception. You know, maybe could go through two or three of these workflow kind of type platforms um, for the customer. That kind of stitching together and that removing friction for us, for them is going to be a big part of what we do next year. So exciting times. Yeah, yeah. Space. Yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot we can do. And again, part of the challenge, as always, is Choose you know, there's loads plan. of things we could do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How can we be super focused on yeah. A, kind of, what delivers the most value to customers, yeah. super important, yeah. and then B, kind of, you know, well, why us? But that sounds sort of very you and Christian in terms of the approach that you guys would take from, from what I know of it anyway, from, as I say, from looking in. Yeah. It's a, it's you know, the natural sort of player. There's a lot, when there's so many different things you want to go at, the discipline of, of picking the right sort of things is so key to it all, and I've got no doubt that you know that as well. So right <laughs> man and the right job. James, absolute pleasure. Thanks so much for coming in and joining us today. People who are watching it and want to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Well, they can obviously always hit me up by LinkedIn. That's probably kind of the main place that I'm kind of on. You know, you can come to the Duco website, kind of find us there as well. But uh, but yeah, we're always easy to find. Good man. Well, listen, lovely to have you on the show. Thanks for coming in. Thanks, Toby. And thank you all for watching. We will see you soon on another episode of Fintech Focus TV. Thanks a lot. Yeah.